Hi, this is Dale from vhorizon.co.uk and today I'm going to show you how to load balance VMware Horizon View 6 with Citrix Netscaler. So first let's have a little talk about the versions being used. Uh, this is my own lab, so within the uh, within my lab I've got a virtual appliance for the Netscaler, so it's a VPX appliance. Um, it's running, as you can see, the Express version, which is a free version you get with all the features enabled, uh, but it's kind of rather limited to its throughput, but being a lab environment, environment doesn't matter to me. Uh, it's running a version of uh, Netscaler 10.5 which is uh, fairly recent, it's not it's not the newest but it's the one I'm running at the moment which is uh, gives us all the features we need to load balance uh, VMware View. VMware View, um, I've got uh, VMware View 6 which is uh, at the moment is just the the first release that I've got, I haven't actually managed to get around to updating it to the, to the update packs or anything yet. Um, but yes I'm lucky enough to have some VXPET keys which I've utilised to actually uh, provide this uh, provide VMware view within the lab. Okay, so if we quick look at the view configuration, we've got two view connection servers that are stored with the defaults. So each one is looking at themselves to provide the uh, protocoling for HTTPS and the BLAST protocol. Uh, if we go through to the desktop pools, I've got one desktop, desktop pool created. Uh, it's basically got one virtual machine in it because uh, I've got a reasonable lab. It's got a 32 gig memory white box in it but it's it still I like to thin down the resources as much as I can get away with um, uh, so we've got one one instance of a, of a pool desktop in there to, to play with okay so now if we go back to the Netscaler and we'll start configuring uh, the Netscaler to load balance VMware view so to start with there's a couple of things that you need to decide first and that is uh, basically the DNS URL that you want to be using for uh, your load balance instance uh, because it's not going to be the individual DNS names for connection servers it'll be something like uh, in my case it's uh, view.vhorizon.local because that's my internal domain um, and I've already registered that against an IP address uh, which I can ping which I've reg already registered against my domain controller's DNS settings which of course at the moment nothing's configured for it so I'll just get I'll get the IP address but no actual response because we don't have any virtual servers hosting that particular uh, that service yet. Okay so the first thing we need to do is think about SSL certificates. Uh, now these are important because they need to be loaded in a couple of places. They need to be loaded onto the connection servers themselves uh, which if you've seen my other blog post on load balancing VMware view security servers for external access uh, the process is the same there you basically replace the certificate with a um, the DNS URL that you want to use for the load balanced instance and then uh, change the friendly name to VDM then restart the services and you also need to import the SSL certificate into the Netscaler for use uh, for one of the virtual servers so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to navigate through traffic management down to SSL and what we need to do is import a PFX file. Now this, the file is generated uh, on an IIS server. So I've gone through uh, to IIS, gone to service certificate and then created a new certificate signing request. Um, I've then got that minted off by the internal domain certificate authority I've, authority I've got in my lab, uh, which has provided me with a certificate. I've added that back into IS, ISS and I've exported the whole lot, including the private keys, uh, password protected into a, a PFX file. Um, the important thing to think of when you're thinking about the DNS URL inside a Netscaler if you're using the SSL certificate on the Netscaler is it has to have the private key with it otherwise you will, will not be able to bind that certificate to uh, say a virtual server or a VIP depending on uh, which terminology you want to use um, it'll complain and it won't allow you to do it and it won't work correctly so you need to have the private key exported with this certificate itself in order for that to work uh, you can also create a CSR on the Netscaler itself um, and then mint that off against your internal CA or an external CA depending on where the actual URL is looking or you know, how your how your processes work uh, but generally an IIS box will do fine and it's recognised by most people on, on the process of how to do it and how to update it. So I've got the PFX file here on my desktop uh, I've also got the vHorizon root certificate uh, again this is a lab environment so it's in no way best practice at all but we've got a, a root certificate for the, the root certificate authority that's uh, spread throughout the domain uh, and then this obviously links to the, to the actual view.vhorizon.local certificate itself. So first thing we need to do is import the certificate into the Netscaler. So first of all I'm going to click on this import PKCS12 and 
we've got an output file name uh, box here which is a little bit confusing but it actually means what do you want the certificate to be called when it's imported into the Netscaler in, in the file directory uh, so we'll call it something like uh, I don't know uh, v underscore v horizon underscore pfx that'll do uh, and then you select browse and make sure it's looking at the local machine when you click browse uh, so we click on the desktop button uh, let's find my certificate there it is, okay. Now I've obviously got a super secret password which I'm going to use here. Uh, and then you click OK to import it. Okay, so that's imported. So once you've got this certificate imported, that doesn't actually mean you can use it yet, it's just that it's actually inside the Netscaler to be installed. So next thing you have to do is you have to tick, uh, click on the certificates button, then you click install. Uh, and now you give it a, another friendly name, which is the name that you use uh, when you're referencing the certificate from within inside things like service groups and virtual servers. So we just call this one something like uh, that'll do nicely. Okay. So because it's a PFX and it also wants the key file name, you reference that file we've imported twice because it contains the both the certificate and the actual private key. So now we want to look at the appliance itself because the, uh, the certificate is now installed within the appliance. Uh, we reference our PFX file here and open it up. And again here, um, because as, as mentioned, it holds the PFX file holds both the uh, private key and the certificate itself. Okay, we'll input the password again. If I can type that, of course. Uh, and click install. Okay, so the certificate is installed. We can see it's valid. It's got a expiry uh, number of days on it. Uh, and it has the private key file there. Excellent, so that's good. So the next thing we're going to install is the uh, root certificate. So if we click install, uh, we'll give it something else now, like, uh, let's say, Horizon underscore root, for example. Local, we'll look, grab the certificate from my machine. There we go. Now, this certificate is just a plain certificate. It doesn't require the PFX file. It doesn't reply, require a uh, private key, which is fine. It doesn't have a password. It's just, just a certificate that I've basically gone into uh, my browser, looked at a website, an internal website, and pulled the root. A root certificate out through the browser. So I'll install that. And there we have it. Brilliant, there it is. Okay, so the next thing we need to do now is certificate linking. Uh, a lot of things like the view client, uh, Citrix receiver, and website, um, some browsers and websites uh, are a bit funny if they don't actually see the proper certificate chain in place and for external usage there's things like SSL shop or whatever where you can check the actual linking to make sure it's right if something's not working correctly which is nine times out of ten the problem um, so what we need to do is link the view certificate with the v horizon root certificate together so click on view and then click uh, actions and then link we basically have one option which is the root certificate uh, that's the only one that's valid for the, for the certificate that I've actually selected. Click OK and it's linked. OK, so that's SSL installed, uh, ready to go. So now basically we need to go through uh, and add the view servers and then create the service groups and load and then the load balance them with the VIPs. OK, so if you now go to Traffic Management, Expand Load Balancing, click on the Servers button. OK, so this is where you add in the uh, backend servers to the Netscaler and it basically tells the Netscaler that, that it's allowed uh, to talk to the servers at the back end. It doesn't tell them traffic types, doesn't tell anything about them servers, it just says they're there, you can use them in your configuration. So we click on add um, and I'm going to keep it fairly similar uh, to the naming convention externally. Um, in my case this is my first view connection server. So all you need to do is put the server name in and then the IP address. Uh, server name is just a friendly name, um, so you don't need to do it by uh, DNS name, but it's uh, for my little brain, that's kind of how, how it works best for me. Okay, and if I go through and add in the second one. Uh, 
excellent okay click create we're done that's basically the the two servers added in nothing needs uh, more doing about that so the next thing uh, we need to con consider creating are monitors now monitors allow the netscaler uh, to inspect the back-end traffic uh, on services or service groups to ensure that that service that they're providing is valid and it's up so um, a lot of other solutions um, basically they either do a ping request or, or TCP or something fairly fairly simple um, I see a lot of instances where load balance is based load balancing uh, checking is based on pings uh, that tells you whether the server is up but it doesn't tell you naturally whether the service inside it the server is up so that's not really the best way to do it so uh, inbuilt into the Netscaler we've got an HTTPS monitor which is one we're going to use but we do need to create a custom one for the BLAST protocol uh, because the BLAST protocol works on ports 8443 it's HTTPS as well but there is something else um, that we get that we need to actually uh, to, to create a custom monitor for so if we want to navigate directly to, for example, a, again, if I can type pro properly, uh, directly to a, the brass protocol port, we'll get this error message, missing root token in request. Um, if we were to do that through IE, we would also get a slightly different error message. my page couldn't be found. So that's basically 404 request. Um, so in this instance um, a 404 error message is actually a valid check to see whether the service is running. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a custom monitor and I'm going to call it say for example uh, view underscore blast okay and then we need to change the type to be an HTTP monitor. Notice there's no SSL or a HTTPS monitor there that we can use, so we choose that. Uh, then basically scroll down the page a little bit, and then we choose the destination destination port, which we know is going to be 8443, uh, because that's the blast port. Then we scroll down a bit more, and we check this little box down here that says secure, which tells it that it's a secure socket layer port. Okay. So we're not quite done yet, so if we scroll back up the page and then click special parameters, uh, we've got a, by default, it adds in a 200 request there, which is a, a web page get OK request or something like that. You know, if, you, if you're a web development guy or whatever, then you'll know exactly what that means. I know roughly what it does, but uh, that's about it. But So what we're going to do is add in uh, the 404 request, which tells us that it will pass, the monitor will pass its test if it gets a 404 response back from the server. Uh, so we click OK on that and then add it in with the little plus button. Uh, we don't need to worry about any of this other stuff up here. You can do lots of magical stuff with that, but I'm not interested in that in the moment. OK, so we just check. We've got that there. Secure. Brilliant. Click Create. And that's our custom monitor done for use. So if we look at the top of the page here, we've got View Blast. So that's our custom monitor. Now what we need to do is create our service groups. So the service groups define the port and the protocol that's used and which servers that those that, that is bound to. Um, so the difference between services and service groups is that service group binds multiple backend servers into the same port and protocol or a service you define the port and protocol for each individual server. So if you can use service groups to actually make things a little easier to read by binding multiple servers into, into one instance then use that. But if for whatever reason you can't then you can use the services uh, node uh, to define them individually but it's it's not ideal it's kind of not the way i do any of this any any longer um so we click on uh, service groups we click add and then we'll give this one say a uh, friendly name so if you do the standard https one first we click the, uh, the protocol type we'll choose ssl okay so we've got lots of other options there that we don't, we don't really need to know anything about that uh we just click ok so we've created the basis for our service group. Now we need to add in extra options to actually configure to enable the service group to be up and watch servers are going to be added uh, and various other things. So first of all, we need to add in members. So that's our backend servers that we've added. So click members. And here it says no service group members. So you click that and it allows you to add in the server. So you click on the server-based ones because we've already created them and added them. 
uh, click in this click to select box and we should go tick tick okay added brilliant okay so now we can uh, change the port if you want to be if it's something wild or wacky but it's not so we just type in port 443 and click create okay so we've got those two uh, connection servers now uh, primarily bound to the service group that's uh, for serving HTTPS uh, requests uh, so the next thing we need to do now is add in a monitor so that it checks the backend service to make sure HTTPS is running constantly uh, so again we just go through click to select monitor in very the same fashion uh, find the standard HTTPS monitor which is this one click OK brilliant and we're done Excellent. Okay, so down now to certificates. Uh, for an HTTPS service group to work, it needs to have a certificate bound to it. Uh, so we do that, and we'll select the certificate uh, that we created it, that we imported into the NetScaler earlier on. So click on those to service certificate, and then we'll choose view.vhorizon.local. Click OK. Click Continue, and we're done. That's basically it. So you click done. I mean, so at the moment it's showing as the effective state is down and hopefully once we've done that it should change to up we get a refresh and there we go that we're up so if you want to if if this showed anything different i'll show that to you a little bit later you can actually check it uh which server's up and which server's down uh but i'll come back to that later on so we create the second service group which is going to be the blast protocol service group so we give it a again a friendly name uh, and this time we need to use SSL bridging um, as the protocol so it's still using SSL traffic but it's not actually doing anything in a way it's just passing it straight through to the backend servers the reason is basically is the, the authentication method used is TLS uh, version 1.1 or 1.2 or something which the actual Netscaler itself the VPX edition of it so the virtual edition that you install into uh, vSphere or Zen server or Hyper-V whatever it happens to be doesn't support that yet um, I've been reliably told that's coming in Q2 2015 but it's not there yet if you've got an MPX so if you've got a big bit of Netscaler tin in your data center uh, that's humming away you've got lovely pretty flashing lights and all that kind of stuff then it does and it's just a tick box to enable it but at the moment SSL bridge is the way to go for VPX editions which is a very common uh, fit for most organizations um, so we click OK excellent OK so we'll do a very similar thing that we did before we'll add in, add in our mentor, uh, members and we'll click service group member and again we'll click on server base because we've already created them click to select and we'll tick our little connection servers here add in the port which is now 8443 because it's obviously the blast protocol click create on there uh, and now you notice there's no no option to actually add certificates in because it's not doing anything uh, in regards to SSL. It's literally just passing um, traffic to traverse backwards and forwards through it. Uh, so click on monitors, and then what we'll do is we'll bind our custom monitor that we've created previously. Uh, so this time now it's uh, in there. It'll appear at the bottom of the list. Uh, click OK. Bind, okay, and similarly, shown it's down now within a couple of clicks, it should show us up uh, with a little bit of luck. Excellent, there we go. So it's up. So the monitors are actually communicating with the connection servers now and they're checking the status of both connection servers. Um, I'll have a show you quickly what happens when one fails or, or whatever in a minute to give you a rough idea of what to quickly look for to see if there's a problem. Uh, but for the time being, that, that's all we need to do. So, last couple of pieces of the puzzle is we now need to create our virtual servers which will be the IP addresses that uh, view client or browsers hit to actually get uh, desktops and services from the connection servers. So now if we go into virtual servers we click add and again we'll give this a friendly name um, again it's a lab so I'm not too fussed on what, the, what that particular name is. We'll choose SSL uh, we'll do the HTTPS one first. And now the IP address I've chosen from my lab uh, is uh, 122.25. That's great. So we've created the basic bare bones uh, of the load balance virtual server here. So we click OK. And very similarly to service groups, we need to add in uh, the things, the bindings. So we we'll click on our service group binding and add in the HTTP view HTTPS 
group that we created earlier. Click OK and bind it. Excellent, so we've got that. Click OK there. And we go down to Service Certificates. And then choose our view.vhorizon.local certificate. Uh, click OK and bind it as well. Click OK in there. OK, so that's basically it for creating that particular virtual server. We'll click OK. We should have, if we refresh the page, our first uh, virtual server. So now we need to go ahead and create the second virtual server, which is the one for the BLAST protocol. Um, yeah. OK, brilliant. OK, so you can do that and then you choose SSL bridge. OK, so I'll put in the IP address here. And then the port, which is uh, 8443. Click OK. And again, we bind the virtual server to the service group. So you click here, click to select, and then you choose the blast service group that we created earlier on. Bind it to the uh, to the vServer. And click OK there. Again, you'll notice you get no pop-ups at all for the certificate because it's not doing anything with it, so we don't need to worry about that at all. Um, persistence we shan't worry about now. I'll talk to you about that shortly. Uh, but we're basically done this. We click done. And again, a quick refresh later, we should see it's all up and looking healthy. Um, so what you'll probably see for these two instances here, the persistence is different. So you've got none here in SSL session here. Um, now that is actually overridden uh, by the last piece of the uh, Netscaler puzzle that we need to complete, which is uh, persistency groups. Now persistency groups have two functions really, is that they bind um, a persistency type. So say, for example, we're going to use um, source IP. So the client, my particular endpoint is going to go to the Netscaler and it's going to actually be given uh, a connection to a backend server based on its IP and then a timeout value on that. Or we can use other things like cookie insert or something like that, you know, depending on, on, on the solution you want to use. And also it ensures that when you log in uh, to multiple vServers, so if you have a solution like ours where you've got a view uh, connection servers which have services on different ports um, that the actual client that's coming in goes gets directed to the same back-end server uh, no matter what virtual server it's actually uh, connecting to so say if we authenticate into HTTPS so we go into port 443 um, we authenticate to that we get sent to VVC 601 uh, without persistency groups there's no guarantee that when we actually uh, click the blast button uh, and switch across to 8443 that we're not going to get directed to VVC 602 uh, which is going to cause us a problem because there's a, an authentication issues there straight away uh, for other more complex and larger uh, solutions then that causes uh, loads of headaches um, so persistency groups binds a client to a particular uh, backend server and also creates a persistent um, persistent persistency <laughs> um, uh, across the virtual server. So if we go to pers persistency groups and we click add, uh, so we create a friendly name for it and we choose source IP. Uh, generally the defaults are okay, okay here, so it selects it based on the exact client IP address that it's coming from. You can change this down to a 7 IP address if you want to or something like that. But uh, you know, it's that's generally fine. The only thing I do generally change is the timeout value to something like 20 is kind of a standard. And then after some testing, you can change that if you want to. Now, to add in the virtual servers that we've just created, uh, click Add down here, and you've got our Blast and uh, HTTPS protocol here. So just click the plus boxes next to them, and it adds them to the actual configured uh, view box on the right. Click Create. And we're done. So that's our persistency groups created. We've added in service to the uh, next scaler. We've added in the service groups telling it what which port and protocol those backend servers are using. And we add in added in the virtual servers which the clients are going to connect to to, uh, to get their desktops by means of browser or client. Um, so that's basically the configuration done. Um, so all we need to do now is click save. And I can't stress to you enough how important it is to click save. Um, very much think of it as a word document or a switch if you will you know many years ago we were all saying uh, staff and users to actually uh, click save on that word document and not rely on that little bar that popped over off to and said auto save because it never really worked very well and things were 
you'd lose things. In the same instance here, if you rebooted uh, an Netscaler or something happened to it and it restarted um, before you'd actually hit the save button, uh, like a switch or a Word document, that configuration change between the save, uh, the previous save, and when it rebooted would be lost. Um, so there'll be lots of head scratching and, and worrying about that. So click the save button as often as you can. Uh, if you click it after every, every action, then all more's the better. Just uh, just get in the habit of doing it. So we've got that saved. Uh, so we've got the virtual servers. They're showing us up and responding. Uh, if I ping them, I should be able to get a response out of them now. Excellent. There we go. So we can see that it's up. It's pinging. It's responding. That's great. So now we need to go to to our a view administrator console. If it hasn't timed me out already, probably has. Uh, now if you go down to click under view configuration, then click on servers. Brilliant, still logged in. Uh, and then right click on your first server, click edit. And here we go. So we've got our default install, which is basically it just points to the local machine for uh, the external URLs for both, HTTP, for both HTTPS and BLAST protocol. Uh, so if we change that to our load balanced URL. And click OK. Now we'll do the same for this one. And click OK. That's the uh, the extent of the complexity of uh, a configuring view uh, for a load balanced environment. And now, so we should be able to test the uh, test the solution. Okay, so now if we open up my uh, view client, we'll add a new server and we'll give it the load balanced server name. Oh, again, my typing's abysmal today. Okay, there we go. So I'll put in my username and password. See, it likes the certificates, happy with that. Click login. Brilliant. Okay, so I've got my desktop pool here. Uh, my extremely complex one desktop. So if we click on that, we should see that uh, login scripts and everything comparing, we've got a view desktop. Excellent. So we confirm that's works. That's PCRP doing its doing its thing. Uh, so if we now log out PCRP, Again, this takes, takes a little bit of time, so it's, it's a lab environment, so it's not the fastest thing in the world. So if we go to here, HPS, uh, view .view is not local, local, we click on the HTML access, and again, into the same credentials. Uh, click on my desktop. we again get the same desktop, uh, but this time through the browser through the BLAST protocol. So that's basically how you use uh, an Xcaler to load balance it. Uh, so if you show you a couple of the examples now of, um, of failure scenarios, uh, so basically what we're gonna do is go through uh, and shut one down and we'll basically show you what, what the uh, Netscaler looks like when uh, one of the connection servers is shut down. Okay, so I'm just going to switch across to one of my VMs. Uh, let's shut down, let's have a go, let's see. Shut down my second one. Shut down. Okay, so if we quickly switch back here. Yeah. Right, so if we quickly switch back to our Netscaler to refresh on the screen. It shows us up. But what you will see on the percentage of health here on the Right hand side, you've got 50% health. One up, one down. Okay, so service is still up, it's still working. We can still get to our horizon view. Uh, if we log out of there. Okay, so that's still working. You can still uh, navigate to the pages because it's automatically failing over to the remaining uh, view connection server. If we look at the service groups, we can now see that the service groups are in the partial up stage. Uh, so what we can then do is we can click, click on one of the service groups, uh, 
and go into them and then again click on the service group members page and click on service or service group and then click on a member uh, and there's a button up here that says monitor details so you can click on the monitor and say uh, okay so this one's got a, a valid response that's working that's fine that's up uh, if we click on this one what we should be seeing is oh dear it's down okay so it tells you that particular virtual server is down uh, and there's a problem with it. it tells you how many probes it sent how many failed uh, and how many failed in this current cycle so uh, when member goes down uh, it starts the actual cycle of uh, counting how many failures are happening at that particular time uh, but it will monitor the total failures so you can get an idea there of the uh, any possible ongoing issues you have with a, with a back-end server so if you have say like uh, 200 total failures and maybe 20 current total failures you know it's failed a few times and something's had going on with it. it's worth checking it out um, so that's what the Netscaler looks like when it's uh, partially up uh, and of course if we take down the second one that's just going to say down it's going to be a big red big red spot there it's showing that everything's down and nothing's actually working at all uh, so we'll just do that quick so we just take down my other, uh, my other connection server okay there it goes uh, back into here we should see very soon that There it goes down one, and then it goes down the other. So, because uh, he's workstation to actually shut it down, it's doing a clean shutdown to stopping the services, etc. Um, if it it would fail a lot quicker than that if there was a sudden kind of blue screen issue or something. But all the virtual servers are showing us down because there's nothing that's able to be serviced uh, by those servers anymore. If we go into the service groups, it's showing you it's down as well. Uh, so that's basically what it's going to look like uh, if there's a problem. Um, you could tie it in with other other solutions such as a uh, uh, Netscaler Insight to give you more granular um, information on metrics and failures, and it, uh, things like email um, warnings, etc. Uh, but that's what it'll look like within Netscaler when something fails. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the video. Um, I'd like to thank you for watching. If you need any more information, please go to freehorizon.co.uk. Thanks very much. Bye bye.